are back. We're gonna wait a couple minutes, let people join. people joining hi how's everybody doing we are back here at Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park for segment number two of the day and in this segment we're gonna be doing some Dutch oven cooking and butter making I'm gonna give it just a little bit longer let some more people join us hi everybody thanks for joining us so again, my name is Holly Thane. I am an interpreter one here at Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park. And because of COVID, we aren't able to do our in-person Gold Rush Live like we do every year. So we decided to bring it to you virtual this year. So we are doing segments, segments at 10, 11, 1, and 2 o'clock today and tomorrow. So we met James Marshall at 10 o'clock this morning. And now we are going to meet Mrs. Davis, and she's going to show us her Dutch oven cooking, her butter making, and I think she has some yummy treats to show you that she's been cooking. So just a little longer, let a few more people join. I see the numbers going up. Do we have any classes joining us? Anybody want to put in the chat if you're a, a class that's joining us right now? Anybody outside of California is, or is everybody local right now? I'm going to let uh, Mrs. Davis do some of her demonstration and then if you guys have questions, we'll go to questions and uh, we'll answer your questions live. Okay, so here we go. Let's introduce Mrs. Davis. She is going to be teaching us about Dutch oven cooking, butter making and show you some of the treats that she has. So let me flip you around. Mrs. Davis, are you ready? Okay. Well, I'm just churning butter right now. I'm doing it the hard way. When we came across the prairies, I got to do it the easy way. And that was I would put my butter churn on the wagon and let it churn all day long, keep checking it until it turned into butter and save myself a little bit of energy. So I'm churning right now, this is a butter churn. The lid comes off and you can see what the rest of the churn looks like. There's actually cream in here and I get the cream from my Jersey cow that I brought with me. She's a little tiny brown cow, about a thousand pounds. She has great big brown eyes and long eyelashes. So she was a treat to bring across the prairie with me. And plus she gives good milk and butter. And she gives so much butter that I'm able to trade it and get other supplies that I need because not, not everybody was able to bring a cow this early. So as soon as this turns into butter, I'll show you what I've been able to do with it. Over here, I've set up a few things to show you. After I wash my butter, in really cold water, then I have to do something with it besides eat it. And I'm gonna show you a mold that is quite old. It's been in my family for many years and it has a little decoration on it. And so when I sell my butter or trade my butter, I always put my stamp on it because people know my cow, whose name is Bessie, uh, is responsible for this butter. Her butter is kind of light colored I could make it a little bit darker if I wanted to soak some grated carrot in it and then strain that carrot out and I'd get a like the orange color. So sometimes I want to just make sure it stays nice and cold. So I have here what's called a butter bell. If you have ice, you can put the bottom uh, with ice or just cold water. And then the water makes a seal and keeps your butter nice and fresh for a lot longer. If you want to dress up your table, you could make these little pats of butter 
and there are small butter molds here that have their own little decorations. So you might have one or two in your house too, but I have quite a few because I like to make a lot of butter. I've Who also, made all those butter molds for you? Uh, they come from uh, Germany. And this is a butter mold too. It kind of split, but I wanted to keep it. So I've kind of improvised a little bit to make sure I could still use it. And the way it works is this would go through that hole. And then I, when I push the butter out, I would get a decoration somewhat like this, the star shape. Now you have to have something to put your butter on, right? So I also, as I came across the prairie, did a lot of cooking in my Dutch ovens. Now Dutch ovens were actually first created in the Netherlands in the early 1700s, 1702. And then the English kind of stole it, took it to England, and it made its way to the United States in the early 1800s. And some folks say that Paul Revere is the one who's responsible for putting these little legs on. So I brought a little one so you could see just what a small one would look like. You can't pick it up, but if you could, you'd know it's pretty heavy. Could yeah. you repeat that part about Paul Revere? Some folks claim that Paul Revere, who also made pewter pots, also is responsible for these little legs and for this lip around the top of the pan. And the reason you want that is because when you get up in the morning, you're going to start breakfast, probably you're going to have coffee. I do. And so I make my big fire here, I get a lot of coals, get my coffee going, then I start breakfast. The other thing I do is I start dinner because I'm going to put my dinner in my biggest pan put that in the wagon and tonight when we stop at night when we stop our wagon we're going to have dinner already ready for us so what's also unique about the pans is you don't have to just use one pan you can use put your your coals underneath your pan so you grab some coals out of here of course because of fire danger i'm just simulating this and then you would put your coals underneath your pan, and you would also put coals up above that pan. And then you could put another pan on top of that. And you could add more coals to the top of that. And you could just keep going higher and higher because that would make an economic use of all your coal. Now you don't just walk off in 30 minutes, you come back and check your, your, your cooking. You've got to stay right there. You've got to keep your coals going and you've got to move your pans around. Take them off and put them back on. Check your coals, take, add more coals or take some off. And if they started to get a little bit too cool, you could take your pillows and just blow a bunch of hot air in there and make your coals nice and hot again. Now, of course, you don't want to pick up those pans after they start getting hot. You, want, you don't want to use your hands, so you might use your leather gloves or your wool pot holder. Then you can take the lid off, check what's in there. I like to have fruit pie for breakfast, so this morning I made fruit pie and I brought pears with me. Pears came to Coloma to the Gold Rush in 1849 and it came in the form of trees, but they also had dried pears. So I made a pear pie. Yum! And of course I used some of Bessie's milk and cream and some of my own eggs. I made pumpkin bread. Now normally I make the pumpkin bread in the bigger pot because it just gets really hot on the sides and to keep it even I put it in a bigger pot. And 
then Judy, can you tell me a little bit about the type of apron you're wearing? Right. I mentioned that we had a wool pot holder, but this skirt, this apron is actually wool too. One of the leading causes of death for young women and children and wi older women was their clothes would catch on fire when they get too close. And of course they have all these clothes on, they have all the skirts underneath. And if you put an apron that's cotton or silk, it's probably gonna flare up. But if you wear a wool apron, it's going to just melt a little bit. And that's what happened here. And so I had to patch it. So I want it to come down as close to the ground as I can and still not tum stumble around. And then this apron also has a little pinafore. It's called a pinner apron. So I could pin it up if I wanted to make sure my clothes didn't get hurt too. Very smart. So yeah. Then you're probably wondering where I, why I wear this hat. Well, it's because I don't get to wash my hair very often. <laughs> And so this will keep my hat clean and it's white so I can boil it, get it nice and white looking, just like my skirts. I can boil them, get them nice and white. And then I can also add cornstarch and starch them up good so they uh, fan out quite well. So you want to be real careful when you're by the fire. Like I say, you want to make sure you stay there and don't walk away because you can burn things pretty quickly that way. And then after you've done all this cleaning, I'm sure you have a pile of dishes afterwards. I do, I do. And I also have uh, eggs from my chicken. And if you'd like to buy one, I can sell you one. How much for an egg? Oh, not much. I could sell you this one for maybe $3. Three dollars an egg, that sounds like a bargain to me. Would you like it? I'll save it for you. So I have a question for any of the kids that are listening right now, just to think about it. Do any of you know how much we, um, how much a dozen eggs today in 2020 costs? Because Mrs. Davis is saying that it's three dollars an egg back in 1850. So I want you guys to think about that and then we'll go to the question and answer period in a little bit and you guys can We'll uh, talk about the differences in prices. So even though people think that, you know, we're pretty rough and tumble, we don't get to wash our hair a lot, we still like to be clean, we still like to look pretty. So over here I set up a clean, a place to get clean. have a little wash stand and I brought some soap. The soap, I can use this for everything. I can wash my hair with this soap so it's going to dry it out quite a bit so I don't wash my hair really often. I can shave it up and put it in my dishwater, use it for dish soap. I'll shave it up and put it in for, and so I can wash my clothes with it too and also wash my hands. So we want to stay nice and clean. One of the leading causes of death I mentioned was fire for women, but also food poisoning. Food poisoning. So you want to make sure that you don't poison your family. And because there's no refrigeration, you have to be awfully careful how you serve your food. And then Judy, I see a beautiful quilt behind you. Do you mind just giving us a little background on that quilt? Unfortunately, someone washed it, and so it's a little bit distorted. If it weren't, you'd be able to see that not only is it quilted, but the inside is quilted into some really unique little patterns too. Because like I say, we like to have things look pretty and nice, and that's, this is one way we could use up our old aprons, our old clothes. So this might have come from my husband's shirt, this might have come from my daughter's dress. And what I do is I buy a full bolt of, of material. 
and in that bolt is probably around 10 or 12 yards. So sometimes we're all dressed pretty much alike because we <laughs> want to use up that material. And then when it gets faded or torn or worn out, then we'll do something else with it. We'll make it into aprons or quilts or braided rugs. All right, so I think it's time for some questions. If anybody wants to type into the chat area, if you guys have some questions for Mrs. Davis here. Uh, I'll ask a, f a few just to get everybody started. Um, I know you mentioned the Jersey cows. Why were those um, preferred for making milk and butter? Well, Jersey's Number one, they're, they're a small animal and they're easier to feed than the bigger Holsteins or Guernseys. And their butter content is a lot higher than some of the other cows. So if you wanted more butter than milk, you might want a Jersey because you'd get a lot more butter from her than you might from the other animals. Um, there's an animal that came over earlier to the United States. Named, it was called a short corn milker. And not only did it provide a lot of milk and it's probably the most popular cow. It also um, produced oranger butter so it was a little more pleasant looking and they use that also for the cheeses because the cheese looks more presentable when it's a little bit more orange too. <laughs> then you don't have to grate the carrot into the cream and strain the carrot out so you get your orange color. And it's keratin. It actually, uh, they actually produce some keratin the short horn milkers uh, to make that orange. And when did you travel here to Coloma? Can, can you tell us a little bit about your personal background story? Uh, well, we came out in about 1850. Um, we, we started baking right away. We brought our baking things with us. Of course, we had to wait and ask or uh, order lumber from the sawmill here. And so by about 1855, we were all set up and we even make wedding cakes. Uh, we serve ice cream. We get our ice from uh, Ice House, which goes to Placerville, gets stored all summer long in straw in some of those deep, deep tunnels that Placerville has. And then you own a bakery here in Coloma, is that correct? Right. My husband, Luther Davis, and I uh, run this bakery. And sometimes we'll have little chairs sitting out here. People come and have coffee and eat bread and just socialize. So it's kind of a social place to be too. How wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Does anybody have any other questions? I think Mrs. Davis answered most of the ones that we had. Did you talk about um, when people started using Dutch ovens? About what year? Well, they started, like I say, in the Netherlands, and that was in 1702. And then England caught on um, that it was a pretty good product because they were using pewter, which is a very light product. And the Dutch ovens are nice and heavy and they last a long time. So they kind of stole the idea and they learned that they had to make sand molds in order to make their little ovens. And then it came over to the United States. And Another interesting thing about Dutch ovens is Lewis and Clark on the Lewis and Clark expedition. They took uh, Dutch ovens with them. So they sailed up the Missouri River, got off in about the North, in North Dakota, about the Bismarck Mandan area. And from there on, they went by either river or horse or actually had to carry the, the Dutch ovens with them, along with all their ammunition, which was all, also very heavy. Wow, Dutch ovens are very heavy. I'm impressed that they were carrying those. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> Especially with just maybe one pack animal. <laughs> yeah, they often had pack animals, but there were times that they had to actually not have animals and they actually had to actually carry it for a while. And they'd carry it, they'll cache some of their stuff and then go back and get it later and bring it forward or use it or go to their cache on the way back and uh, get some of their supplies. 
Well, thank you very much, Ms. Davis. We learned a lot about Dutch ovens. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, it looks like we've answered everything. Well, thank you. I'm gonna flip around to uh, myself really quick here. Thank you for joining us for part two right now. So we just met Ms. Davis talking about Dutch oven cooking and making butter and a little history about both of those and the animals that were used. Join us again at one o'clock this afternoon where we are going to learn about rope making and see a live demonstration of that. And then again at two o'clock for spinning and learning about dyeing and wool and weaving, things like that. And then remember again tomorrow to join us at 10, 11, one and two for more virtual Gold Rush Live demonstrations from our amazing docents here at Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park. Bye, see you guys at one o'clock. <laughs>